Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Ken, this is my colleague Alex, and we're here to talk about aviation security. Now the first thing I want to say is don't hack planes. It is illegal, it's dangerous, you'll go to jail. But what we want to show you today is some of the 101s, some of the terminology you'll find upon planes, some of the systems you'll find, some of the security levels you'll find. There are huge levels of redundancy, isolation and security on planes. You can't hack planes. But there are lots of interesting technologies you're going to find on there. Little background to us, so Alex and I are both light aircraft pilots. Alex, I found out five minutes ago, is actually a qualified aeronautical engineer. I didn't know that. But it's actually quite a useful set of skills to bring together. Sort of things that we've done in the past, looking at embedded system security. So we're well known for our work in automotive, so car hacking, also in shipping, and IoT. You've probably seen lots of our work out there in the press. Some of you might be familiar with John McAfee's cryptocurrency wallet, the BitFi, the unhackable one that we hacked, but hey. All very useful and relevant experience when you come to looking at embedded system security. We've even tested oil rigs and shown how from the public internet we could shift a rig off station. Crazy stuff, hey? Now, Alex is the clever one. I'm just the monkey who gets to hold probes in ports. That's him working. We've had some really interesting experience of late. One of the huge challenges for a security researcher is there are big barriers to entry, not least cost of components. We've got an avionics device out there on our table, a switch that's $75,000 to buy new. So there are huge barriers to entry. And there are also huge challenges with understanding, getting access to data sheets, and understanding how the technology works. Now, we've been very lucky. We found a friendly boneyard that we asked nicely, and they said, could we come and have a look at some of your end-of-life airframes? And they said, yeah. So usually when they fly in to be parted out, they're going to be sat there for two, three, four days whilst to get the engines off, which have already been pre-sold. But the ground power systems are still working. But you're working on an end-of-life device that isn't going to fly anymore. So you can look at it, you can inspect it, you can play with it without fear for affecting people's safety. And that has been really, really interesting. We learn a huge amount about that. Now, words of caution. Airliners, airplanes last a long time. If you find issues with them, they're very difficult to fix. They have to go through testing, recertification, and that takes a long time. So vulnerability disclosure in, in this industry isn't 90 days. It takes a long time to get that code checked, recertified, deployed for safety reasons. So don't expect manufacturers to come back to you and go, hey, yeah, that's fine, publish that. It doesn't work like that. You need to be safe. I fly, I travel a lot, and I want to feel safe when I'm flying. I don't want people messing around with planes. However, in the past, the security model was fundamentally physical with huge layers of redundancy. So for example, in the case of autopilots, if you want to do a Cat 3C auto land in zero viz, Three autopilots need to be working and operating. If one does something odd, the other two disregard it and can land safely. There's huge areas of redundancy and failover. There are routes to disclose responsibly. You can work direct with manufacturers. You can work direct with regulators. There are routes to get vulnerabilities disclosed confidentially and safely. So please, if you find anything, do it responsibly. There is no value to publishing a story in the press that scares everyone off flying. That doesn't help anybody. Disclose responsibly. So how did we get started? Well, we got access to end-of-life airframes in the boneyard. That one don't work so well anymore. <laughs> There's more missing than present, I think. But we've had access to various airplanes, landed the day before, and got the chance to start looking at them. So it's my turn to hand over to Alex, who's going to tell you what sort of things we looked at and what to find and what's there. Well, thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm going to walk through kind of all the interfaces you might find on an aircraft. Some of them might be familiar to you and others not. But broadly, um, the aircraft is split, or the avionics is split into three domains, um, passenger, information, and control. So control is the highest level of safety. So this is anything that is going to be safety of flight critical, so autopilots, engines, that kind of stuff. 
there's an information domain. So this is nice to have info. So weather, um, navigational routing updates, efficiency, um, uh, connections to airline systems, so they might be able to help you uh, if the aircraft is running late, they might be able to rebook you onto another flight actually from the aircraft itself. So they're not flight critical, but they're, they're kind of nice to have. And then finally, there's the, the passenger uh, domain, so that's where you have your in-flight entertainment, the screens on the seat back, uh, in-flight Wi-Fi, that kind of stuff. So these are from the least trusted to the most trusted, and there should be no route from the least trusted to the most trusted uh, domain. So there should be no way to get from the passenger domain up to the flight control domain, as you would expect. So I know this is going to sound a bit 101, but that was the title of the talk I came up with. But here's an airplane. There's a pointy bit in a hangar. Um, when it's in a hangar, it actually has ground power connected to it. And we'll touch on the challenges around power and testing later. But um, you know, if it's in a hangar, it's going to be connected um, to a, to a main supply. There are going to usually be two avionics bays um, and accesses through a hatch in the side of, of the aircraft. So this is how the physical control of um, security is implemented. You know, these things are airside. All these avionics are behind locked doors and avionics bays. Uh, inside these avionics bays, it looks something quite dank and horrible, and it's really noisy. Um, they have forced air, air conditioning, so when the power is up and running, it's deafening. So if you're thinking of working there, take earplugs, please. It's really horrible to work in. Um, so these are what are termed line replaceable units. So there is a rack, and they lift out via a handle, and they push into connectors. The idea being that these are interchangeable units. Um, so if there's a fault on one, they can be easily pulled out and swapped back in again hence LRUs. So you can see at the back, um, lots of discrete cabling, and this is the traditional way that aircraft have been, have been built, is that there are line replaceable units and they are cabled via their own cable routes up to the cockpit. So these cable routes have to be checked and certified so that things don't interfere with each other. If you want to install a new bit of kit, then everything has to be recertified all over again so that there's no interference between uh, neighboring cable runs. So really starting at the basics, what, what do we have on aircraft? Well, we have, we have radios, um, we have VHF and HF radios. Uh, VHF is used for uh, speaking to air traffic control, um, but also for navigational aids that we'll, we'll touch on later. If you want to travel further, then we have HF radios. VHF is line of sight only, so although aircraft fly really high, you still have a fairly limited range. So if you're flying across a big ocean, then you're gonna need a HF radio system. Um, the VHF and HF radios also integrate with um, a system called ACARS, and ACARS is a short text messaging service. And of course, you know, ideally would have afforded our own aircraft to come here today, but it's quite a long way. So the best we can do is, is to have a party flight on, on ACARS. Um, but we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of aircraft airborne every day. We, we can't have encrypted communications over radio. It's just not feasible to manage uh, the cryptographic keys between uh, aircraft themselves um, and the ground. So VHF and HF is all unencrypted. You can buy a $20 receiver and you can listen into your local airport. You can listen into stuff. People even broadcast it on, on the internet. So you can sit there and listen to uh, planes talking indecipherable gibberish with uh, air traffic. Um, so the ACAR system actually is really, really interesting in that you can actually push out routes um, to ACARs and do other things with it, uh, aside from just text message. Those routes have to be uh, approved by the pilot and accepted. So there is always a human in the loop there. Obviously, these days, aircraft will have some sort of a satellite navigation system, like GPS. Um, the precision levels of GPS aren't quite there for full automatic landing, so there are these overlay services. So there is a GPS ground station that is in a very known fixed position, and that is compared with the GPS signal that is coming down, and a differential between the known location and what GPS location says is applied. Um, so you can have sort of atmospheric effects that distort the signal. So this is then broadcast over radio and satellite 
to give uh, a much higher degree of precision, sub-meter uh, levels of precision. But we all know that GPS, um, although there are encrypted levels, um, the unencrypted system used on civil levels um, can be jammed. So I've got an example here, sorry at the back, but here's an example of a, a notice to airmen. I'm sorry, it's a really gendered terminology, but notice to airmen um, that in the UK that the, the military are operating a jamming exercise in this area. And it's really interesting that when you read the NOTAM, actually for you know, 100 miles around this area, potentially GPS could, could be affected. So GPS spoofing and jamming is definitely an issue. Um, the military and foreign governments have certainly been known to, uh, to, to do it. There are, I would term, legacy navigational systems on the aircraft as well. So we're not just reliant on GPS as the sole navigational system. There are radio navigational aids. So some of these date from the 1930s. Um, so, for example, um, uh, VOR and NDB and DME, th these all date from the 1930s, along with the instrument landing system, but ILS is, is in use daily. So the ILS is used to guide the aircraft in uh, to land. And there has been work shown relatively recently on how uh, spoofed ILS signals could cause an aircraft to land off-center. But I think it's really important to take that in, in context in that if you've got visual uh, with the runway then a pilot is going to notice that you're landing off center but obviously if it's zero visibility um, then you may not actually be able to see the painting uh, paint on the runway to be able to realize that that's happening so there is this interoperability between GPS the overlay services and other radio navigational aids to kind of bring a holistic view and kind of mitigate some of these risks so if we look on an, um, on our aviation chart, we can actually see some of these uh, legacy beacons listed. So the, if I can zoom in, doesn't work, great. Um, but the circle in the center uh, labeled EGLL, that's London Heathrow. Um, we're starting to replace these legacy navigational aids with just waypoints in a database. So uh, rather than rely on fixed radio navigational beacons, we have waypoints, three-dimensional waypoints in the sky, and we give them cute names, and air traffic controllers kind of get to name them and name these routes. Um, and these are programmed in the flight management system. So there has to be a regular update of the flight management system waypoint database to every time new ones are issued that these are, are, are set up. Um, so air traffic control might tell you to route to Whiskey or to Bravo or to Star or Juliet or whatever, and you would find that waypoint name in your database and the aircraft will then fly to it. It's a virtual thing. There is no physical beacon that, that shows you where that is. It's all based on um, the navigational systems in the aircraft itself. Um, so in this, you can see that sort of traditionally some of the... Um, uh, upper airways and navigational routes have converged on these legacy beacons just because of how they are but now they're starting to converge on these virtual waypoints instead so this is kind of the way that we're, we're moving because we want to maximize efficiency of, of airspace so having and running physical beacons is expensive um, and difficult to maintain and less flexible so we're moving now to these these waypoints in databases instead aircraft have satcom on them they're not only used for uh, in-flight entertainment purposes, but they're used for by people like Rolls-Royce. Um, I, I think it's an apocryphal story, but I think it might be true that Rolls-Royce lose money on every engine sale that they make. Uh, if you buy an engine or uh, from, from Rolls-Royce, you buy it for less than it costs Rolls-Royce to make it. But they make all the money back over the lifetime on sales and maintenance, and if you pay them a, a, a giant wad of money, they will monitor your engine in real time over things like SATCOM. Um, so they can see in their network operation center in Derby in the UK, if one of your engines is running out of performance, they can even get a part to wait for that aircraft to la uh, when you land at JFK, for example, they could have a part waiting for you so you can get it on and get that aircraft away really quickly. So it's not only engine data, but it's for passenger Wi-Fi um, and also tracking as the um, MH370 uh, that disappeared in Malaysia 
um, showed that EMASAR did some really great work on being able to look at pings and find out where the aircraft kind of potentially was, although kind of sadly never been found. Now, we've done an awful lot of work on SATCOM in maritime, and not all of it great. Yeah, so this is some of the work we started looking at in uh, shipping. Now, shipping tends to be much less secure than aviation, but we started to notice a lot of commonalities. So, for example, this is a terminal that we were looking at on a particular vessel. We've actually got one of these terminals sat over in the maritime village right now. And we tend to find is in maritime, people don't really pay attention to keeping the software up to date. And this particular um, terminal we found on a boat, we found we could remotely compromise it and route all the way through the vessel networks into the OT systems and take control of the engine. So this is why it's so important to keep software and technology bang up to date. And that's another interesting challenge for aviation is lots of different systems needing checked validation, certification, confidence they're secure, which is all difficult to do when you're trying to keep up with security and security vulnerabilities. It's just another challenge to add to the layer of complexity that you've got. Now, I don't believe that these, um, these sort of vulnerabilities are to be found in aircraft. I think aviation manufacturers are much more responsible. They have much more um, uh, vested interest in keeping it that way. But we do find significant problems in SATCOMs in maritime. So, sorry to continue with the acronym BLAST. I mean, IT is notorious for acronyms, but aviation is way, way worse. And you bring the two together, and it's just horrific. But I think it's maybe uh, lesser known that when you're on, on Wi-Fi, you're kind of assuming that on your, your plane that everything's going up in the sky via satellites when you're browsing Twitter or whatever. But actually, in most of Europe and US, there is a termed a complementary ground component. Um, so when you're over land, there are actually um, just LTE masks that operate on the two gigahertz band, so it's just the same as your mobile phone, except that the, the antennas are pointed upwards rather than horizontally. So next time you're kind of surfing the internet and you're flying over the continental US, the chances are that your internet traffic is going out of the bottom of the airplane and back over the mobile phone network um, rather than um, satcom connection. So there is Wi-Fi on, on, on aircraft, um, not only for passenger um, access, but also for um, Gatelink. And Gatelink started as a sort of proprietary radio protocol, and it was used for exchanging um, data about the past sector that the, the aircraft has just flown back to the airline, but also for receiving information about the next sector it's going to fly. So it's trying to cut down on the time it takes for um, the people at the gate to print out the load sheet, um, get you your waypoints and routing, Again, it's just trying to maximize the, uh, um, the efficiency of the aircraft by minimizing the amount of time that it's actually on the ground. Every time it's got weight on wheels, then you know, the aircraft isn't really making money. So you want it flying kind of all the time. So Gatelink has kind of morphed. Um, and there are now Gatelink boxes and aircraft that use Wi-Fi. Um, so Gatelink set up access points at participating airports. Um, and when the aircraft detects that it's landed, so there's weight on wheels. Um, there it also will receive a feed from the GPS system so it knows which airport it's at. And it will look in, a, in its box and it will work out which Wi-Fi um, SSIDs to connect to, what the passphrase is, what the security, etc. So when as the aircraft arrives at the gate, it will join that Wi-Fi network um, and it will then, again, exchange information back with the airlines, receive data for the next segment, and, and again, try and maximize efficiency. But again, I think it's showing that where there were proprietary protocols, it's now moving to commodity ones, and it's kind of lowering that, that bar to malicious actors, um, where Gatelink was something you might have to really um, decipher and spend thousands of dollars trying to understand, well, well Wi-Fi is stuff that, that we all know about here at DEF CON. Um, there are... Um, uh, other sources of data on aircraft, so flight data acquisition units and quick access recorders. So again, airlines want to um, do sort of almost big data analytics on their fleet. They want to know well in advance that there is a problem, not, not a safety critical one, but an efficiency one. If there's um, a problem with the engines where they're consuming a bit more fuel than they anticipate, then they want to start um, trying to bring forward maintenance to address that. Fuel is the major cost in, in airline operations. So if it's something that's consuming more fuel than you expected, you kind of want to address that. 
Um, and traditionally, the way of doing this was having uh, a flight data acquisition unit in the aircraft that um, sucked in lots of parameters from all sorts of systems. And we've got one out on our, on our stand in the Aviation Village, so you can come and have a look. And the one that we've got uses a magneto optical drive. Um, yeah, really. Um, but you've also seen ones with PC cards, but these require someone to climb into the avionics bay, eject that disc, and then ship it back to the airline. So again, to maximize efficiency, you know, they're starting to put in wireless ones. So they're putting in Wi-Fi, and they're putting in wireless uh, 4G modems, um, so that when the aircraft lands, all this data is kind of instantly transmitted back. So this is a wireless quick access recorder um, off the FCC website. So again, it's showing that the, the bar to access this information, whereby you maybe previously had to buy, um, buy avionics at a huge premium, um, you can just go to the FCC website and this information is public. So here you can see what wireless cars are in use, there's a USB port on the other side. So this is all kind of interesting information when you're trying to explore the interfaces to, um, to aircraft. So radar is an interesting one. There are primary radar, so the big spinny thing you see at airports, sends out pulses of radio waves and listens for the responses. But radar, primary radar is not great. You get returns of things like uh, thunderstorms, flocks of birds, uh, insects I saw recently, you know, like a whole uh, ants, flying ants in the UK showed up on, on radar. Um, passing trucks will even give um, radar returns. And all of this adds clutter to air traffic and it's difficult for them to work out what is noise versus real aircraft. So we started putting transponders in aircraft. So as soon as they're illuminated by a primary radar source, they send back um, over a different radio channel information about their height, um, a, um, a serial number, so that traffic control, air traffic control can associate um, and see much better what aircraft are doing, what height they are, and assign them kind of a unique code so they can track them better. Now, this has started to um, evolve a bit, and there is a protocol called ADSB. And ADSB has started to become mandatory in the US uh, from next year. So if you fly a light aircraft, you will have to have an ADSB uh, transmitter fitted to your aircraft. And ADSB interfaces with GPS um, to provide also rather than just a code, but also your exact height and location information in that return. And um, Renderman, who was in the panel uh, previously, you probably heard has done some work on ADSB spoofing. Um, this is all unencrypted information. So you can, you can view ADSB transmissions from aircraft so you can see where they are. I think maybe it's not a known thing that if you look on something like flight radar, they do actually filter out certain ADSB uh, channels from military, uh, police helicopters, things like that. But you can buy a $5 TV dongle off eBay and you can listen to ADSB returns on your own. And if you come to the village, um, people will show you how to do that. So you can see unfiltered ADSB responses. And, and again, I don't think um, regulators have quite cottoned on to something that was a, a safety critical service and now has kind of security implications because it's an unencrypted broadcast protocol. Um, there is another service on commercial airliners called TCAS, which is a traffic collision avoidance system. Now, TCAS operates on its own band, and uh, aircraft communicate with themselves to try and keep them away from each other. But TCAS can also take a feed in from ADSB. So, only large commercial aircraft will have TCAS fitted, but smaller light aircraft may also infringe into the airspace of commercial aircraft and therefore you kind of want to know where they might be coming from. So uh, um, TCAS can use ADSB transmissions to give you um, a deconfliction advice. Now on really, really modern aircraft, A350s, A380s, there is an option for TCAS to be coupled with the autopilot. And if a pilot doesn't take evasive action, then um, TCAS will drive the autopilot and move the aircraft for you. So you can see the potential risk for um, spoofed ADSB transmissions to start moving aircraft around in the sky. So where there's no real aircraft, it could potentially cause it to climb or descend. Now I think it's really important to note that some of these systems are disengaged 
when aircraft are near the ground, for example, when they're in landing configuration, um, and that there is a lot of separation in controlled airspace between other aircraft. So the chances of this actually causing an incident, I think, is very, very low, but it could be enough to unsettle a pilot. And so I think um, airlines need to be quite careful when they, they couple um, collision avoidance systems with automatic systems in this way. They need to be conscious that ADSB is unencrypted and broadcast. People can see it and manipulate it and spoof it. And therefore, relying on this as, as a, a security system is maybe not the best idea. Um, so here's one of our uh, flight data acquisition units, not to be confused with the orange uh, black box. So uh, it's a pet thing. You know, they're, they're not black, they're orange. Um, but the flight data recorder is black. So if you want to come and see a flight data acquisition unit, come over to the village and you can have a look at the crazy magneto optical drive. Um, but these things store much more information than a, a copy voice recorder or a flight data recorder. They only store a few hundred parameters and for an hour, a, a flight data acquisition unit stores pretty much everything, thousands and thousands of parameters and for much longer, you know, 72 hours or more. So maybe the bit that's kind of more interesting is in the passenger domain. You know, what are you seeing when you sit there? You know, all of this stuff is up to now has kind of been hidden away from you. So a lot of the stuff flying you, you probably know is really tiny screens, really crappy IFE that's really fuzzy, um, and it's quite old. But you know, 20 year old stuff is not uncommon to find on aircraft and is still current and flying. They're starting to move maybe towards um, Android tablets um, but again, they're, they're, they're of, of, a, of an older vintage. Um, some of them have a USB on them, not only for charging, but so you can play your media through the screen. Um, there's an integration with a flight management system. So that moving map you see um, with the aircraft moving, there is a connection to the aircraft's navigational systems to do that. Now, this is crossing domains from the flight control domain into the passenger domain. But it's going from a high, high uh, a highly trusted area to a less trusted area, and there are um, data diodes in use, so that this is a unidirectional connection only. Now, I, I think there was has been some previous uh, alarmist reporting on being able to control the aircraft through IFE systems, and I and I find that highly highly unlikely. Um, that there are multiple layers you would have to jump through, and. Aircraft networks are segregated and segmented. And frankly, I have seen um, way worse network segmentation when I go and break into corporate IT offices than I see on aircraft. So uh, I think you should, um, as with everything in IT, take some things with a bit of a pinch of salt. Um, so there is also the delightfully named FAP, the flight attendant panel. So when you come onto the aircraft, there is a, a touch screen now that allows the um, flight crew um, to dim the lights, set the boarding music, all that kind of stuff. And if you look, there's often USB on there. Um, USB is used for updating the music, but also to tell the aircraft about new seating arrangements. Airlines like to move and resize business class and where I sit at the back in, in cattle class. Um, so in order to kind of adjust um, air conditioning and stuff like that, they need to update the seat layout, and that's done via USB. But the USB inputs on, these, on, the, on the flight attendant panels um, are heavily filtered um, so that they don't um, accept any old inputs. Um, again, there's Wi-Fi, there is a passenger domain Wi-Fi, and there is a crew domain Wi-Fi. Um, the crew Wi-Fi gives them more access. They don't have to pay for it for a start but it also gives them maybe dedicated access through to the airline system so they can rebook you and stuff through, um, through iPads. Um, we've got some uh, IFE seat boxes um, at the village. So here's kind of, uh, yep, it looks pretty old and, and it is, but you still see them flying. So it's, it's, um, it's an X86 space system. It's actually got AT. If you look on it, it's got a sound blaster card in it. It's like properly vintage and really, really retro. Um, and yeah, there are there are PLCCs on there. There's all that kind of good stuff from from you know 20 years ago. Um, up at the pointy end. I mean, I was lucky to grow up when you were still allowed to go up to the cockpit when it was in flight. And 
I'm not sure many people get that opportunity these days, but if you haven't been out there, that's what our flight deck looks like. I think they're really, really cool, interesting places. Um, they have, you know, really, really fancy screens. But what do the screens do? Well, there's, again, redundancy for everything. We've got two humans in the cockpit, a captain and a first officer, and we, we duplicate, in, in fact, triplicate um, the really, really important stuff. So on the left-hand side, the leftmost screen is the primary flight display. So that's showing you which way is sky and which way is earth, how fast you're going, how high you're going, which way you're pointing. The really, really critical things for flying an aircraft. The one next to it is showing a navigational display where the autopilot is planning to take the, the aircraft next. Um, and this is duplicated on the first officer's side. And in fact, there's another primary flight display which is completely segregated from all these systems. So if all else fails, they can still fly the aircraft by hand. So up on the top is the autopilot and navigational mode display. So the autopilot has many, 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 many modes. So you can get it to climb at a certain rate, hold a heading, hold an altitude, hold a speed, configure for landing, all that kind of stuff. And all that is done from the glare shield above. So both, um, both pilots can see what mode the aircraft is set in. In the middle here, depending on which uh, airframe manufacturer, is the crew alerting system or um, alert management system. And this is designed to kind of tell you when there are problems, show you what state the avionics are in, what the engines are doing, stuff that isn't need to be right there in front of you, but needs to be readily accessible and shows you when there is a problem. We don't want to give you unnecessary information, but we want to um, be sure that you can see it and be alerted to it when there is actually a problem. Um, at the bottom here is all the radio settings, so for voice and data, and for HF, and for navigation, and for interfacing with ACARS. And we have our two um, MCDUs, or interfaces into the flight management system. Uh, again, we've got a, a really awesome vintage one on, on our stands, so if you want to come and have a look at one um, inside. Beautiful wire wrapping and the levels of redundancy, again, that go into the design of these. Um, please come and have a look. But these are designed to be kind of a multiple interface, uh, interface to multiple systems on the aircraft. Um, so this is what drives your route, how you update the navigational system, all that kind of thing. So on more modern aircraft, um, we're starting to integrate um, what are called electronic flight bags. Back in the day, you would see the pilot come on with a big suitcase, power full of flight manuals, and paper charts, and plates, and you know they would get repetitive strain injury from carrying these things through airports. Um, so initially, um, this transition to just having an iPad or similar that the crew carried on to the aircraft with these things um, in electronic form, and these were termed sort of class one devices. They had power from the aircraft, but but nothing else. They would sit on the on the side of the glare shield and just be sort of an electronic replacement for the paper charts and manuals that they already carried. But now we're starting to move on to more integrated systems, class two and class three devices that actually integrate with aircraft systems. They can connect via cable or through Wi-Fi and actually start um, transferring a, a route directly onto the flight management system itself. So you can start to see that there is an enterprise IT management segment. It's not just avionics anymore. We're having to um, manage not only pilot iPads, um, back-end systems for, for electronic flight bags, but also for maintenance crews. When they come onto the aircraft, they want to do um, updates, they want to retrieve data, but they have to plug in their laptop somehow. And again, there's an enterprise IT management issue in, in how those laptops are maintained, made, made malware-free. So it's not just uh, black boxes in an aircraft anymore. These are now you know, connected systems. But how are these things all kind of connected together? Well, back in the 1970s, um, we came up with Arink 429. And because it's the 1970s, um, cryptography wasn't a thing back then, or at least you know, to, to Joe Public. Um, so there is no encryption and there is no authentication on, on Arink 429. But that's OK, because it's a point-to-point -point protocol. It's used to connect um, line replaceable units uh, in the aircraft together. There is no bus that you can see. Um, you, you can't connect to Arring 429 from, from the passenger domain. Um, so, so again, the physical access controls kick in. 
so it, it's a, a single source um, to single sync protocol. It uses a, a differential voltage um, uh, type setup. Um, so it's looking for sort of um, plus 10 and minus 10 volts in order to, to um, uh, eliminate interference issues. Um, uh, you can readily obtain ARING 49 decoders, either sort of USB ones, um, people have written Raspberry Pi interfaces. Um, if you've got a PicoScope, there's um, a 429 decoder. Now you can see 429 in aircraft cockpits, but on a very limited way. Um, these are used for um, interfacing with um, the flight management system and other bits and, bits and pieces, um, although data load is, is a separate protocol itself. But um, if, if you did have access to 429, then yeah, you can intercept, you can replay messages. There's none of, none of uh, no replay compression, there's no encryption. But it, but it is um, a point-to-point -point protocol, and the chances of you being able to find that on an aircraft are, are low. So it does have a really strange uh, message structure. Uh, I probably don't want to go into it. Um, but um, there was an attempt to um, fix this issue of all this proliferation of cabling. Um, so when um, Boeing designed the 777, they came up with a protocol called 629. Um, so this is a bus and there are um, inductive couplers, and again, you can take a look at one in the village. Um, and inductive couplers connect to a pair of wires. There is an A bus and a B bus, and this is a multi-source, multi-sync, true bus protocol. But again, these wires run through bits of the aircraft that you're, you're never gonna get to see. Um, they don't run through the passenger domain. So the physical access control um, is sufficient mitigation to deal with um, the fact that you can just clip onto one of these cables. Now, decoding 629 is really tough. Um, in fact, there's kind of pretty much only one manufacturer that we found, um, so shout out to them, uh, who've lent us kit in the past. So if you want to decode it with uh, Max Technologies and you want to buy one, that's $30,000 if you want to buy this piece of kit um, and look at one. So uh, 629 is only found on, on the 777, um, but as we now go to more modern aircraft, so A350, A380, 787, 737 MAX family, for example, we've gone, we've gone to Ethernet. So this is starting to sound quite familiar to the people here at DEF CON. So it's got a posh name, AFDX or ARINC664, but under the hood, it is kind of Ethernet. And in fact, if you go to um, avionics test beds, they use commodity Ethernet switches to save money. Now, we don't use commodity Ethernet switches on aircraft. Um, they're they're going to be optical. They are highly resilient. We use them in uh, multiple redundant pairs. They're segmented. Um, and they use uh, what are called virtual links rather than IP addressing. But it is still common to find ICMP, UDP, SNMP floating around on these networks. So it's all stuff that's, that's really familiar to us. So again, you're starting to see maybe the bar of, bar of access starting to decrease rather than these kind of esoteric um, protocols. CAN also appears on aircraft. Um, on the A380, the overhead panel with all the buttons and environmental sensors and temperature and environmental controls is all run on CAN. So again, a differential voltage protocol um, to minimize interference. Um, and shout out to um, people in the village who I've talked about uh, CAN, but in general aviation, um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, in this case, it was a, a fuel sender. But again, CAN, yes, is an unencrypted, unauthenticated protocol, but you have to have physical access to, to manipulate this. And we put aircraft airside, we put things behind locked cockpit doors. So there are mitigations. Again, if it was a general aircraft, it's gonna be in a hangar, you're gonna you know, lock the door, hopefully. Um, if someone has physical access to your plane, they're probably going to rob it more than mess with the fuel senders on it. Now, power on aircraft is really weird. So it's 115 volt AC, 400 hertz, um, or 28 volt DC in some places. Um, so if you're working on an aircraft, you're going to have to take your own power. There's nowhere for you to plug your laptop in. Um, if you want to uh, hoover vacuum an aircraft, um, then you're going to have to buy a very special $400 vacuum cleaner to do that. Um, so this is what, you know, when they clean the aircraft, this is what they're bringing on to do it. 
Um, so you're going to have to consider this when you're working uh, in an aircraft environment. And it is tricky. So we brought some uh, avionics LIUs with us. They're, they're all of a certain vintage, but I, they are still flying today, even though they're 20 years old. Um, but that, that hardware reverse engineering strategy is pretty similar to everything else. Is that you take boards apart, you look for um, data sheets, you look for them part numbers, you start tracing tracks. Everything that's like, really familiar to us. Um, what's kind of really irritating is it's dipped in a conformal coating, so if you want to start tracing and buzzing out, it's really irritating to do. But, you know, they're designed to be living in a hostile environment, so you would expect that. Um, there are um, uh, PLCCs on there, um, so you can try and drop the firmware out of it. A lot of them have readout protection on them, but some of them maybe don't. But all of the tools that you're familiar with, Segas, Sallets, um, you are all that kind of stuff is completely applicable. So if you've done any hardware RE, then you can start looking at these from a black box perspective. Um, as Ken has said, you know, if you're starting to find stuff, um, then you need to be reporting that through the appropriate channels. Um, but these things are designed for redundancy. Um, you see PLCCs a lot. They are designed just in ICS and SCADA. They are designed um, to be used in a highly resilient and fail safe and safety critical way. But things are kind of starting to change. Um, so we're now starting to see um, common compute systems, common compute resources. So rather than having discrete line replaceable units and black boxes in avionics bays, there are line cards and commodity processes um, that run software. So VXWorks is quite common to see. Um, and there are firmware updates for this. So you can go to a um, uh, vendor website and you can download and modify the behavior of the aircraft in limited ways so on those nice flat screens on the aircraft you might want to have different checklist items for startup and takeoff for example and airlines can customize that to a certain degree using airline provided tools that are then uploaded and these are actually cryptographically signed um, so again, you can see there is significant mitigation. It's not like someone hacking a text file. Uh, the, these are quite controlled um, devices. But because it's, you know, VxWorks, there's hypervisors, there's Linux kernels. Um, again, you can see that the bar of access is starting to, to drop down. So as my voice is starting to give out, we've kind of come to the end. And what I want to say is that, yes, stuff back in the day was predicated on the physical access model. But we've always had humans in the loop. You know, if the aircraft starts behaving a bit weirdly, the autopilot can be disengaged, the human can start flying it. And that, and that I think is fine. And I think people need to keep that perspective. But yes, in the drive for efficiency, airlines and manufacturers are starting to put on Wi-Fi, 4G, SATCOM, and these carry a security risk. And they have done due diligence, but there is room to meet in the middle. And that's why we're running the Aviation Village here, um, is, to, is to bring together the minds of um, people who've worked on automotive and hardware security, and to bring that unpredictability of, of that threat. Um, together with aviation so that everything is safer. We all want to carry on flying. And 20 years ago, maybe the, the threat model was who would want to hurt aircraft? And now I think that has definitely changed. Um, and that is a good, good place to be. But there are many, many mitigations as we've talked about. There's built-in redundancy, there's lots of systems. You can't just go hack a plane. So forgive for the slightly clickbaity title, um, but hopefully, that's a quick run through of all of the acronyms and things you might find on aircraft. Um, and hopefully when you're flying, you're going to feel a bit safer. So thank you. If there's any questions, we've got a few minutes to take them. Um, but otherwise, we're going to be at the Aviation Village. Do come and find us. Thank you.